Pregnancy at Risk, Pregnancy-Related Complications, Chapter 17. Okay, so the LPN roles include identification of risk factors for pregnancy-related complications through either patient interview or data collection. And then you must be able to identify signs of complications and know what problems need prompt intervention. Okay, so hyperemesis gravidarium. This is a disorder of early pregnancy. It's often characterized by severe nausea and vomiting. It results in weight loss, nutritional deficiencies, and or electrolyte imbalance, and acid-base imbalances. Most often appears between eight and 12 weeks gestation, and it's usually resolved by 20, the 20th week of uh, pregnancy. The exact cause is unknown, and then um, it is different than just regular morning sickness. Risk factors, um, hyperemesis is increased with a multiple gestation, a molar pregnancy, and when there is any history of hyperemesis gravidarium in the past. So whenever you're looking at this, you also want to look at with molar pregnancies, that is a higher, um, higher HCG levels. And anytime you have higher HCG levels, you're going to have more of that nausea feeling. Okay, stress and physiological factors can contribute to this condition as well, so we will have to get a thorough history there and make sure that it isn't something psychological. Clinical manifestations, okay, again, it's distinguished from morning sickness. It's more severe than just morning sickness. It can cause severe acid-base imbalances. Ultrasound is often helpful in determining whether or not it is a molar pregnancy. We'll discuss that further in this slideshow. Uh, clinical features, symptoms of dehydration, postural hypotension, and elevated hematocrit. Okay, the treatment, often emergency treatment is directed towards correcting that fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Anytime you have a patient who is gonna be nauseous, think about the things, the methods that you're gonna do for that patient. How are you gonna help get them over that? First, they should always be NPO, at least for the first 24 hours or until vomiting stops. We're probably gonna give this patient some vitamin B6 with or without doxylamine, and that's usually recommended for sign therapy. Treatment, any anti-emetics may be used. However, many of them are category C and can be harmful for the fetus, so oftentimes the doctors will look at that and um, not necessarily order those unless they need to. If they do order them, however, they like to keep them on a round-the-clock schedule, not just PRN here and there. They find that um, it has a more effective, uh, it's much more effective when given on a regular around-the-clock schedule, schedule versus the PRN. Um, given by parental injection or rectal suppository until the vomiting is under control. Of course, you're not going to give them anything by mouth if they're vomiting. They'll just throw it back up. So we have to give it some other route. And then once the vomiting has stopped, we'll start them on a clear liquid diet and then advance them as, tolerate, as tolerated. Uh, usually bland diet and then move them up. And then thymine supplements are often ordered as well. Um, hyperemesis gravidarium, the nursing care for this, assess the woman for nausea and administer any animatics as ordered, record eyes and nose, assess for signs of dehydration, monitor lab values, and then of course after the vomiting is stopped, you're going to implement measures to promote that intake, provide mouth care before and after meals, and then observe any family dynamics because as we said before, Sometimes this can be stress or psychological things occurring in her life and not always um, just due to medical. So we want to watch that as well. And then, of course, monitor the fetal heart rate. Make sure that the baby is not in any stress. Okay, bleeding disorders. Bleeding disorders can occur any time during pregnancy. Oftentimes with early pregnancy, it can be ectopic pregnancy, spontaneous abortion, or a molar pregnancy. A mid-pregnancy, a lot of times that will be cervical insufficiency. 
late pregnancy, um, usually due to placenta previa or abrupto placenta. Um, we have to be aware of signs and symptoms of bleeding, and you're also going to be thinking of hy hypovolemic shock as well. Okay, so with the next topic, pregnancy, that is a pregnancy that occurs outside the uterus, and the most common area for it to occur is in the tube, the fallopian tube, so we call it a tubal pregnancy. Leading cause of pregnancy related death in the first trimester. And any condition or surgical procedure that can injure a fallopian tube will put the woman at higher risk for having a tubal pregnancy. Clinical manifestations. Um, symptoms usually appear between four and eight weeks after their last menstrual period. Most commonly reported symptoms are pelvic pain and or vaginal spotting. Late signs such as shoulder pain or referred pain hypovolemic shock, these signs are associated with tubal rupture and so therefore we're very concerned about her. You're thinking shock, you're thinking rapid ready pulse, increased respirations, shallow irregular breathing, um, her blood pressure is probably falling, urine output's falling as well, pale, cold, clammy skin, all of these things you're automatically going to be thinking shock and those are late signs. That that means you need to get her into ICU. She needs to get into the hospital immediately. Um, diagnosis is not always immediately apparent. A serum or urine pregnancy test is often done. Transvaginal ultrasound is done. Kuldocentesis uh, and then a laparoscopic. A laparoscopic can also be done to rule out. Um, moving on. Treatment. Management depends on the condition on, of the woman. Shock requires emergency treatment, ICU fluids, get her down there quick, get her back on blood expanders, transfusion, whatever it takes. Um, Non-emergency, emergent diagnosed cases of tubal pregnancy, a lot of times we can do laparoscopic surgery, which is most common. Uh, Sulfonectomy or intramuscular injections of methotrexate. Methotrexate, it's actually a chemotherapy drug and it will attack the whole trans, uh, the cell division. It will stop cell division and kind of make it stop growing that way. And because of that, the whole process will disseminate a little bit. Um, and then, of course, in any of these situations, if the mother is RH negative, she will require a Rogam shot. And that just suppresses her immune system from attacking RH positive, so it won't harm the baby. Uh, nursing care, we're gonna measure and record vital signs. We're gonna monitor the amount and appearance of vaginal bleeding, report immediately any heavy bleeding or signs and symptoms of shock. You're gonna assist the RN to prepare the patient for surgery. And then once the patient is in stable condition, address those emotional issues. Um, she did lose a baby, and so we have to address that and be kind and compassionate in that and let her talk about that. We might um, encourage her to go to grief share or do some kind of grief counseling, join a group, something like that to help her uh, work through those issues. Um, of course, before discharge, we have to instruct the woman regarding danger signs that she should report. Any kind of high temperature, vaginal bleeding, anything along those lines. Uh, previous? Okay. Early pregnancy loss, another name is spontaneous abortion or miscarriage, and it's the most common complication of pregnancy. Loss is before the age of viability, which is less than 20 weeks of gestation, or if the baby is less than 350 to 500 grams, that's less than one pound. Common name, miscarriage, and it usually occurs during the first trimester. Factors that increase the risk for spontaneous abortion, advanced maternal age, anything above 35, a history of a previous spontaneous abortion, smoking, alcohol, substance abuse, any of those things are going to put the woman at risk for um, a miscarriage, 
increasing gravity, gravity, gravidity. Oops. Hold on. Pregnancy at risk, pregnancy related complications, chapter 17. Okay, so the LPN's role includes identification of risk factors for pregnancy related complications through patient interview, data collection. Uh, you must also be able to identify signs of complications and know what problems need prompt intervention. All right, so hyperemesis gravidarium. This is a disorder, disorder of early pregnancy. It usually appears between eight and 12 weeks gestation, usually resolved by the 20th week of gestation. And it's characterized by severe nausea and vomiting. And it's separate than just morning sickness. It's much more severe than just morning sickness, often resulting in weight loss, nutritional deficiencies, electrolyte imbalances, and acid-base imbalances. Um, the exact cause is unclear. However, there are some risk factors with hyperemesis. It's increased with a multiple gestation, so multiple babies, a molar pregnancy, which has, as we'll study shortly, higher HCG levels, and that causes more nausea. And then when there's a history of hyperemesis gravidarium in the past, you have a past history, you're more than likely gonna have it again. Um, stress and psychological factors can contribute to the condition as well. So in our history, we need to address those things as well and make sure that there isn't something psychological going on before uh, we roll out all organic methods as well. Clinical manifestations. It's distinguished from that morning sickness. It's much more severe than morning sickness. You will have acid-base imbalances. Ultrasound is often helpful in ruling out molar pregnancies. Clinical features, symptoms of dehydration, postural hypotension, and elevated, elevated hematocrit. For the treatment, emergency treatments directed towards correcting those fluid and electrolyte imbalances, the acid-base imbalances. So as with anyone who is throwing up, we are gonna make them NPO, at least for the first 24 hours or until vomiting stops completely. We'll also give them a vitamin B6 injection with or without a doxylamine, which is the recommended first line therapy. Treatment, antiemetics can be added. However, because most of them are a category C, the doctors want to use um, be very, uh, what's the word, cautious about using them. However, if they do go ahead and order antiemetics, usually the more effective dosing is around the clock dosing, every four hours, every six hours, rather than just PRN as needed. It seems to work a lot better. Um, it's also gonna be given parental injection or via rectal suppository until the vomiting is under control. And then once the vomiting has stopped, we'll start them on a clear liquid diet and then we'll advance as, as tolerate, tolerated, more likely than a bland diet and then move them up from there. Thymine supplements are also going to be administered. And this is to prevent wormix encephalopathy, which is an inflammation and hemorrhaging of the brain. Very often, doesn't ha happen very often, but it's still a risk, and so that's why the thymine supplements will be given. Uh, going along with hyperemesis gravidum, we're going to assess the patient for nausea and then administer any antiemetics as ordered. We're going to be recording her intake and her output. We're going to be assessing for signs of dehydration, monitoring those lab values, and then after the vomiting has stopped, we're going to implement measures measures to promote intake, providing oral um, mouth care before and after meals, and then of course we're going to be going back to observing those family dynamics, making sure that it's not stress or something psychological causing the excess um, vomiting. And you must always monitor the fetal heart rate, fetal heart tones. All right, with bleeding disorders, they can happen anytime during pregnancy, early, mid, or late pregnancy. With early pregnancy, ectopic pregnancy and spontaneous abortion are usually the culprit there, or it could be a molar pregnancy. 
mid-pregnancy, it's usually cervical insufficiency, and then late pregnancy can be placenta previa or um, placenta ruptio. Ectopic pregnancy, a pregnancy that occurs outside the uterus. It's commonly referred to as tubal pregnancy, and that's because it takes place in the fallopian tube. There's other locations in which they can commonly go to, but the most common is going to be in the fallopian tube. And this is the leading cause of pregnancy-related death in the first trimester. Any condition or surgical procedure that can injure a fallopian tube will put that patient at risk. So as we studied previously, you think about pelvic inflammatory disease, scar tissues, the zygote, zygote can't make it to the uterus and it implants outside the uterus. That is going to be an ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so clin clinical manifestations. Symptoms usually appear between four to eight weeks after their last menstrual period. So it's usually fairly quickly that you see it. Um, most commonly reported symptoms are going to be pelvic pain and or vaginal spotting. Late signs would be shoulder pain or referred pain, and that would go along with um, just pain perceived at a different location other than that painful side. So it's really taking place in the uterus or the fallopian tube, but she's feeling pain in the shoulder, and that is a very late sign. Um, also, she could ha come in with hypovolemic shock, and these signs are associated with tubal ruptures. So she, her tube has already ruptured. She is bleeding out, and that is a very, very serious case. Diagnosis is not always immediately apparent. Serum or urine pregnancy is done first. Transvaginal ultrasound is very um, first line of picking it up coldocentesis, and then a laparoscopic, so removing those, removing that material. Uh, treatment management depends on the condition of the woman. Shock requires emergency treatment. Usually she'll be in ICU, maybe getting blood expanders or a transfusion. Non-emergent diagnosed cases of tubal pregnancy, you can do laparoscopic surgery, which is the most common. Uh, cephala, uh, Self-injectomy, self-injectomy, sorry, uh, which is basically the excision of the fallopian tubes. And then uh, you can also give intramuscular injections of methotrexate. And that is an anti-neoplastic, anti anti-cancer drug. And so it stops cell division. It stops that, um, that zygote from expanding any further and will go ahead and um, allow the body to pass on its own. In this situation, of course, any mom who is RH non-sensitive or RH negative, she will require Rogam and so we'll go ahead and administer that. Nursing care, we're going to measure and record her vital signs. We're going to monitor the amount and appearance of vaginal bleeding. Report immediately any heavy bleeding or signs and symptoms of shock. We're going to assist the RN to prepare the patient for surgery. And then once the patient is in stable condition, emotional issues become the focus of the nursing care because she has lost a baby. And so we have to address that, whether it's referring her to counseling, a grief share group, um, we have to be sensitive in that as well. And then before discharge, we must instruct the woman regarding any kind of danger signs she should report. All right, early pregnancy. Another name for this is spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. And it's the most common complication of pregnancy. Losses before the age of viability, which is less than 20 weeks of gestation, or if the baby is less than 350 to 500 grams, that's less than one pound. Um, it usually occurs during the first trimester, at least 80% of it does. And then factors that increase the risk for spontaneous abortion, they include advancing maternal age, so that is any woman who is over 35, a history of previous spontaneous abortion, smoking, alcohol and substance abuse, increasing gravidity, uh, uterine defects and tumors, active maternal infection, and then chronic maternal health factors such as diabetes mellitus 
or renal disease. It's often difficult to determine the exact cause. There's three overall categories of causation. Um, the fetal is usually genetic. Most common cause of spontaneous abortion in the first trimester is chrom chromosomal defects, abnormalities that are just incompatible with life. Um, for maternal, there's multiple factors there. And then environmental, it's poor nutrition, exposures to chemicals, etc. Early abortion typically occurs before 12 weeks, and it's usually fetal cause, chromosomal defects, something along those lines. Late abortion occurs between 12 to 20 weeks, and it's usually more maternal cause. Uh, clinical manifestations. Typical symptoms of spontaneous abortion include cramping and spotting or frank bleeding, and occurs along a continuum, threatened, inevitable, incomplete, complete, and then missed. And if you look in your book at 385, um, table 17.1 goes into more detail on those. HCG levels will be drawn and then a transvaginal ultrasound will be done. The treatment depends on which type of early pregnancy loss is occurring. A threatened abortion, we're going to try more conservative treatment. We're going to wait and see, do the wait and see approach. Put her on bed rest, pelvic rest, and see if um, we can continue to carry out this pregnancy a little bit longer, waiting for the baby to mature more. All other types may use prostaglandin, cytos cytotec by mouth, um, and then vacuum aspiration or, or dilation and curage, a DMC. Those are the most common surgical methods used to clear the uterus. With this, she often will have to go ahead and um, have the baby go through labor, especially if it's after 20 weeks. But for early pregnancy loss, a lot of times we'll give her the prostaglandin and see if she can't go ahead and pass um, the tissue, the fetus. And then if that doesn't work, we'll go ahead and go in and do a DNC. Um, after your uterine evacuation, they'll give them Pitocin, and that's just to kind of close down that uterus, close down the blood vessels and make sure that she doesn't bleed out. Um, Methogen by mouth, uh, it does the same thing. Nursing care, we're going to assess her vitals, amount and appearance of vaginal bleeding and pain level. You're going to be counting peri pads. How many pads is she going through? How much is she bleeding? Does she have clots? What does the blood look like? A uh, report of falling blood pressure and a rising pulse. Of course, we are. she is at risk for hypovolemic shock, so we're watching to make sure that she does not become shocky. You're going to save all expelled tissue. Provide analgesics as ordered. Ibuprofen is best in this situation. Uh, grief reactions are to be expected and are even to be encouraged. Don't make her feel guilty about grieving this child. Um, make sure that you have acceptance and support the woman's emotions in that. Cervical insufficiency. This is talking about an incompetent cervix. And oftentimes you'll see um, it's going to be painless, but the cer cervix is going to be dilating. It's a cervical dilation with the bulging of fetal membranes and parts through the external os in the second trimester. So the cervix is dilating. That baby's trying to come out, but it's too soon. Pregnancy loss is frequently inevitable. However, if we can, we'll go in there and we'll do a cerclage, a little suture, to close up the um, cervix you know, from dilating out, they'll go in, they'll put a suture in there to kind of keep it um, closed. Risk factors, standard treatment, um, cervical collage, like I said, the stitch, it's often performed before 14 and 26 weeks of gestation, and then it's removed at term or whenever the woman starts going into labor. Encompasses, uh, sorry, Gestational trophoblastic disease. Okay, so this encompasses two related disease, related diseases of trophoblastic tissue. In trophoblastic tissue, what that is is layers of cells outside the embryo that enters into formation of the placenta. 
okay, trophoblastic tissue. You have a, a hydatiform mole or a molar pregnancy, and then you also have gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. That neoplasia, you're going to think malignancy of the uterine lining, okay? So one is benign and one is malignant. There's two types of molar pregnancies. You have a partial and then you also have a complete. And both types involve errors in chromosomal duplication during fertilization. Some features of malignancy. Okay, so going back to this, a partial um, has part of fetuses. Now, with the molar pregnancy with gestational trophoblastic that you will not hear any fetal heart rate. There is no baby. There might be, as with the partial, there may be some fetal um, tissue, but with a complete, there is absolutely no fetus. However, um, it does appear and makes itself look just like a pregnancy. Okay. Here is a picture of it, and you'll see these grape-like clusters, this, um, these vesicles in there. And so in here, you can see this molar pregnancy taking place inside the uterus. And then this is also what it would look like on ultrasound. Okay, so the risk factors. History of a previous gestational trophoblastic disease that puts you at risk for more um, in the future. However, that's really a teeny tiny risk. It's not, you don't see that very often. Um, typically takes place in extremes of age, the younger women in their early teens, and then the older women who are nearly near the end of their reproductive lives. They're at the highest risk for this. Clinical manifestations, most common presenting sign for both is partial and complete moles is vaginal bleeding. So you'll start seeing some vaginal bleeding. The HCG levels, we talked about this earlier, typically higher than expected for gestational age. Um, the HCG levels, they will measure that. They will be extremely high, which is also going to cause a lot more nausea, um, as well as whenever you're measuring her abdomen with the, the tape measure from the pubic synthesis bone up you will notice that she is measuring a lot bigger than normal, and that is a sign of a molar pregnancy. We typically do a transvaginal ultrasound. It's very quickly to pick up on ultrasound. And then the treatment is evacuation of the uterus. You must get that out, and you have to do a continued follow-up for one year. And this is extremely important because of those tissues. It can be malignant and it can come back. And so they want to continue uh, drawing labs, drawing your HCG, and making sure that you are not at risk for um, a molar pregnancy or that it comes back. They also want to make sure that you do not get pregnant for six months. And um, we'll do frequent monitoring. We're going to be monitoring for vaginal bleeding. You're going to be checking the condition of the uterine fundus. You're going to be administering oxytocin, getting that uterus to close back up, to um, stop bleeding, get the vessels to close up. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. She is at risk for DIC. And the reason is, is that that molar tissue releases substance that can break down the clotting factors. So we're working with her, making sure that she is not bleeding out. The trophoblastic embolize or pulmonary edema, secondary to fluid overload, and then giving her emotional support. This can be very devastating to a woman because, of course, she was expecting to be pregnant, and then she finds out that not only is she not pregnant, it does have some malignancy with it. So it can be very detrimental to a woman to find that out. All right, we're going to stop here, and I'll do the second part on another... Uh, slide.